Hi Booktube and welcome to the video. I'll be talking about a couple of books, uh, both on Kafka, Gustav Janusz, Conversations with Kafka, translated by uh, Goronui Ries, and Is That Kafka? 99 Finds by Rainer Stach, translated by Kurt Beals. And both of these books were recommended to me by longtime subscriber Mitch Axler, because Mitch knows that Kafka is my favourite writer, which he is. Uh, David Marx is my other favourite writer, but they're sort of, you know, 70 years, 80 years apart in their writing. It's almost like different literatures. Um, so I do maintain them both as my hero author, if you'll forgive me that indulgence. And both are Jewish, uh, as it goes. Anyway, um, so Gustav Janusz was a 17-year-old boy who wrote poetry and showed it to his father. And his father sort of says, oh, I know this writer in my office. I'll, I'll get to have a look at them for you. And that writer was Franz Kafka, and the office was the uh, accident and health insurance, uh, which um, Kafka worked at all his life until he, he was too ill to work. Uh, was highly respected within it, was a lawyer, was called Dr Kafka. Uh, and so uh, the boys introduced to Kafka and they fall into a deep, long-lasting friendship, uh, almost like a mentor relationship. Not on writing, but on life. Uh, they go for long walks together. Uh, Yenish would drop in on Kafka at the office and they'd talk there. Kafka seemed to be able to make time to talk. I don't think he was overly busy, um, which is why probably he was able to sort of compose in his mind. And what we get is a very fond, intimate portrait of Kafka that's different from his letters to Milena, for example, where they are in a relationship and there's all the sort of difficulties of a relationship, one that isn't even requited particularly, and that they are separated because she lived in Vienna and he lived in Prague. Whereas here, there is a space, you know, they are coincide in the same space, Janusz and Kafka. So I think this is, in a way, a lot more, you get a lot more of a 360 on Kafka than you do in the letters to Milena. And in a way, uh, like those letters, uh, what you appreciate is just how switched in Kafka was to his age. You know, we have this image of him as otherworldly, he's sort of an ascetic withdrawn from life, hypochondriac, sort of, you know, um, neurotic. And a lot of that certainly comes across in the letters to Milena. Far less of that is here. Now, admittedly, this may be a very rosy uh, tinted picture that, you know, Jen Oshu was obviously in awe of Kafka paints. But actually, the evidence in the book is there that, that, no, he wasn't withdrawn from life. He was absolutely aware of all the vibrant arts in Prague. He went to lots of readings by other authors. He read their books as they were published. Um, he was incredibly well versed in world events. You know, he basically predicted the Second World War would come. This was in 19, the mid, early 1920s, so, you know, a full... 15 years before it actually happened. He was German, don't forget. He was a German Jew and he knew the character of the German nation as he saw it. And he thought that after World War One that, that, that it would all kick off again. And he was right. He uh, was aware of Mussolini's fascism. He was, you know, quite well up on, on what was happening in Bolshevik Russia. So he's, he's very clued into the world and has lots of, I think, you know, very relevant things, things to say. Um, the manner of, of him is he's, as I sort of described as a mentor, it's a mentor who's a bit like a sort of Talmudic scholar or, a, a, you know, you're holding a, a, with a Buddhist priest, you're asking questions and you get sort of Koranic answers back, which don't always, you know, at first sight, they might be non sequiturs, but not at all. You know, he has, he does have the, the, the world view and the oversight of someone who has withdrawn just to observe his fellow man. Um, he, he is very aware of, you know, the need for a God, but lacking a God, that we are powerless. We can't really affect our fates. We're going to die at some point. And he's much more accepting of his lowly sort of power status. And that informs his manner. You know, he, he never loses his temper. Um, He's always happy to help, to give advice, because he knows it doesn't really matter what he does. Um, he can't tip the balance of anything in his own life or even in others. 
Um, so he said, you know, rather than be horrible about it and be nasty to people, oh, I'm going to be decent. And, you know, that's all to say about it. I, I really enjoyed it. And I'm just going to read some bits just to give you a, an insight. As I say, you could level the accusation this is a bit rose-tinted spectacles of Yenush, uh, you know, but it's understandable. Um, my friend Leo Lederer gave me an illustrated monograph on Michelangelo. I showed the book to Franz Kafka and for a long time he studied the picture of the seated Moses. That is not a leader, he said. He is a judge, a stern judge. In the end, men can only lead by means of harsh, inexorable judgment. And of course, if you think of the trial or in the penal colony or, you know, there's lots of stories about justice in Kafka. Um... Not long ago, I saw a long book by Schlaff in which he claimed that the centre of the earth was the centre of the cosmos. Yes, that was his idea even then, and he tried to convince us of its truth by means of his own special theory of sunspots. He took us to the window of his modest dwelling and showed us the sun with the assistance of a schoolboy's antiquated telescope. You must have laughed. Why? The fact that he dared to do battle with science and the cosmos armed with this ridiculous object inherited from ancient times was so absurd and so affecting at the same time that we almost believed him. What prevented you? As a matter of fact, the coffee, it was bad, we had to leave. So, I just love the way there that he sort of veers from the sort of grandiose, big human ideas of the cosmos and it's a worthwhile activity to study, but bad coffee means, ah, oh, we're, we're checking out of here. Kafka had a very good sense of humour which, you know, you see stated, and unless you are able to read his books in the original German, we don't get that from his books, but, but he, he is a funny guy. Each of us wishes to preserve and possess his life for as long as possible as an individual organism. This is a rejection by which we forfeit life. I don't understand, I said frankly. It's after all a natural that we should wish to live and not to die. What extraordinary offence do we then commit? My voice was slightly ironic, but Franz Kafka did not seem to notice. He said very calmly, We attempt to set our own narrow world above the infinite. Thereby we disturb the rhythm of things. That is our original sin. All phenomena in the cosmos and on earth move in cycles like the heavenly bodies. It is an eternal repetition. Man alone, the concrete living organism, runs a direct course between life and death. For man there is no personal return. He is only following a declining path. So he breaks the cosmic order. That's original sin. So again, you know, Kafka has a very sort of, I mean, it's somewhat weary, pessimistic, and yet he himself is quite jolly. Um, he has this sort of world-weary, we are powerless view of the world, which obviously, you know, informs all of his books. But to hear it sort of stated through... You know, he's not he's not preaching in his books. He's doing it in an allegorical roundabout fashion. Here, he's talking hard and fast. He's discussing hard and fast ideas with Janusz. And again, you get very clear sense of what his own worldview was. Franz Kafka showed me a questionnaire of an inquiry into literature, which I think Otto Pick had drawn up for the Sunday Literary Supplement of the Praga Press. He pointed with his forefinger to the question, what can you say about your future literary plans? And smiled. That's a silly question. It's impossible to answer. I looked at him without understanding. Can one predict how one's heart will beat tomorrow? No, it's not possible. The pen is only a seismographic pencil for the heart. Sorry, the pen is only a seismographic pencil for the heart. It will register earthquakes, but can't predict them. I mean, what a brilliant, pithy summation of the nature of fate. Um, certain changes in organisation were to be carried out in the Workman's Accident Insurance Institution. My father was working on a memorandum on the subject. At lunch, he made notes on the blank margin of his newspaper and at night he shut himself up in the dining room. Kafka smiled when I told him. Your father is a dear elderly child, he said, but so is everyone who believes in reforms. They do not see that the world picture only alters in that something dies and something is born. Something falls and something springs up. That changes the arrangement of the splinters in the kaleidoscope. But only very small children believe that they have reconstructed the toy. Again, you know, I just think he gets, he gets to the heart of the matter so succinctly. 
It's extraordinary. And this is gives an insight into why he ordered Max Brod to destroy all, all his unpublished works, uh, which Brod obviously ignored, uh, after Kafka's death. No, no, he contradicted me, shaking his head. You are wrong. My scribbling does not deserve a leather binding. It's only my own personal spectre of horror. It ought to be printed at all. It should be burned and destroyed. It is without meaning. I became furious. Who told you that? I was forced to contradict him. How can you say such a thing? Can you see into the future? What you're saying to me is entirely your subjective feeling. Perhaps your scribbling, as you call it, will tomorrow represent a significant voice in the world. Who could tell today? Well, <laughs> Janusz was right on that one. Um, you know, Kafka's influence is extraordinary on us. So that was that, five stars. With a caveat that it might be slightly propagandist. Um, now, um, Rainer Stack is the biggest um, sort of multi-volume biography of Kafka. Um, I haven't read them. This is 99 findings that he, you know, in the course of his research he came, he came upon, documents, letters, that sort of thing, which he's presented here to give the lie to, as I say, this view of Kafka as withdrawn, otherworldly, neurotic, hypochondriac, all that sort of stuff. Uh, the first thing he says, I don't know if these 99 facts are contained within his bigger biography of Kafka. I don't know. Um, or whether they would sort of all the bits that wouldn't fit. Uh, and he's put in a book here. I feel that this adds very little and doesn't really uh, um, sort of explode that, that um, picture we have of Kafka any more... Uh, than this does. Um, I got very little out of this, surprisingly. I feel that, you know, there was an interesting point where Kafka and a, it might have been Broad or one of his friends had gone to see the French aviator Louis Blériot, who was doing a fly past. So again, he is in the world. He is not withdrawn from the world. He's up on current events. I did think that was that was interesting. But most of this stuff, I didn't feel made any kind of coherent... I mean, it's bits, it's it's fragments. Why should it make a sort of coherent argument? But I didn't think it really achieved what Stack himself said it set out to achieve. And in a way, the best the best thing in the whole book is uh, an obituary for Milena, who, again, was his would-be uh, lover. Um, she had a good a good take on Kafka. This This is an obituary. I'm not sure where it was published, but anyway. He saw a world full of invisible demons that antagonise and annihilate defenceless people. He was too clear-sighted, too wise to live and too weak to fight. But his was the weakness of noble, beautiful people who are incapable of fighting against fear, against misunderstandings, unkindness and intellectual falsehoods, who are aware of their own powerlessness from the beginning, who submit to it and in doing so cast shame upon the victor. He understood people as only a solitary person can. Someone whose highly sensitive nerves can clairvoyantly comprehend an entire person on the basis of a single facial expression. His knowledge of the world was extraordinary and deep. He himself was an extraordinary and deep world. He wrote the most important books of modern German literature. They contain in an undogmatic form the current age's battle of generations. They possess a true nakedness that makes them appear naturalistic, even when they speak in symbols. So, you know... We have Kafka the man, and we have Kafka's works. Kafka the man was, or no, Kafka's work tend to have a sort of horrific outcome to them. If you think about the trial, if you think about the castle, even America, you know, these, these, these are not happy endings. And Kafka himself, to an outside observer, you might say, well, he had a fairly miserable life uh, and was ill and died young of, of tuberculosis and stuff. But actually, these two books reaffirmed that Kafka the Man, that those books could only be written by Franz Kafka, but Franz Kafka the Man, in writing them, somehow purged himself enough that he could function in the modern world at whatever level he was functioning, remain polite, smile a lot, derive humour and things, keep up to date on current events and be part of the debate on the arts. So there are two sides to Kafka and they don't cross over, they stay in their... This is the fiction he produced versus this is, 
you know, the biographies we've been able to produce about his life. And, you know, and I think, I think, you know, that only endears me to him even more. I will say, I haven't read the Stack uh, biography. I don't know what it's like. My favourite biography is by the Italian uh, author Pietro Citati. This is superb. Um, he only recently died, unfortunately, Citati. And I was so impressed with this book when I read it in my 20s. I actually wrote a play, not about Kafka, but about the ideas and associations that this portrayal of Kafka sparked off of me. It's, it's something quite sort of performative and theatrical about Kafka and this book brings it out really well so I could highly recommend this because you know it's not a multi-volume biography it's um you know just over 300 pages or just under 300 pages it's much more tangible you can get to grips with it this if you wanted to read about Franz Kafka this is the book to do it so just to say um this obviously has been on Kafka on books about Kafka I do have videos on uh, Kafka's fiction um uh you know, that I called a Kafka special. I was looking at his three novels. I can't remember if I looked at the short stories of the same video or a different novel, but I'll post links to whatever I've got um, in the show notes. And yes, Franz Kafka is my favourite author uh, ever, and I can't see him being knocked off that pedestal. Till next time, thanks very much. <laughs>